thank you all for coming. Um, I'm really happy to be here. It's always great. This one. It's always great to get a chance to um, share some of the things that I really care about um, with other people who care about these things too. So um, let's get started. So first, I have to acknowledge all the people who've helped in some of the work that I'm talking about today. I'm not going to spend that much time talking about the work that goes on in my lab, but still. Um, Christina, Tyler, and Kale are my three most recent graduate students who've done a bunch of the work that was just described. Um, some of you probably know Paul Donnell. I know he's a, he's a big fish in uh, marine circles in Anacortes. Um, and some of these other people as well, a lot of the work went on um, down the road at Shannon Point. Um, but also, you know, in cooperation with National Science Foundation and Western and um, Washington State DNR and a bunch of other, bunch of other people care about these things. So um, I'm going to give my little plug for Western also. So Western is a really great place. She mentioned my, you know, interest in teaching, and that's one of the reasons that I'm at Western is that people um, at Western really care about the students and really engage and get the students out in the field and really doing practical, um, you know, boots, boots in the mud type work, which I think is pretty great. We also um, are really highly ranked in terms of sending students for Fulbright scholarships and, for, and to the Peace Corps. Um, I'm a return Peace Corps volunteer myself, so I really, um, I really appreciate that about Western, that our students are people who want to go out there and, and do something, do something good. So. We also have a new marine science major that we're starting up at Western. Um, you may be surprised to know that we didn't have one before. We have a lot of marine scientists, um, but we did not have a major until now. So we're really excited about bringing on even more people to, and more students to study the oceans. Okay, so ocean acidification. So we're gonna talk about, you know, what is it? Why should we care about? What can we do about it? And we're thinking about that all in the context of the Salish Sea about our local waters here. So before we get started, let me do a quick poll of you all. So if you know a lot about ocean acidification, I want your hand like up here. And if you're like, um, I don't know, I heard, heard a few things kind of here. If you're like, I, I don't know anything about ocean acidification. <laughs> okay, all right, we, we've got a range. This is, which is typical. So we'll, we'll go over some of, the, some of the basics, but I won't dwell on it too long. All right, so 20 trillion pounds of CO2 um, are added to the ocean by fossil fuel burning every year. But I mean, that's just like, it's just like a really big number, right? I mean, it's just like a two with a bunch of zeros. Um, it's really hard to contextualize that. So here's my analogy that I use for it. That's the equivalent of one bowling ball per person per day for everyone on Earth. And I'm sure you all are really virtuous in terms of your carbon footprint, but you know, we're Americans. And so that means you're still at least two bowling balls, maybe three or four. Um, so now you can imagine yourself, you know, going down to the marina in the morning with your bowling ball every day, heaving it in, right? The ocean is big, but that's, that's a lot of carbon and it's making a difference. So um, what happens when you add CO2 to the ocean? So we're about doubling the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, which means we're doubling the amount that's in equilibrium with it in the ocean. There's a series of equations that are all in equilibrium with each other. So the result of that is that bicarbonate, which you're familiar with as baking soda, goes up. And carbonate, um, which you may be familiar with as Alka-Seltzer, <laughs> goes down. So the result of that is that things that use CO2 and bicarbonate, like plants and algae, for instance, at first blush are, are happy, right? They've got more of their raw material for doing photosynthesis and growing. Things that make shells, which is which are made out of calcium carbonate, so carbonate is the raw material for that, have problems, because if there's less carbonate, it's harder to make a shell. So those are the kind of two ends of the seesaw of the simple way of thinking about the effects of these changes in the chemistry. But there's a whole bunch of organisms in between. I put my little herring up there that, you know, we don't know. It's, it's unclear what the effects are going to be. 
So we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail as we go forward here. But let's talk about pH for a second first. So this is a graph of ocean pH units going back for the last 400,000 years. And oh, I do have a little pointer here. Oh, OK. There we go. So right, so this is 400,000 years ago over here. And this is now over here. And you've got pH going on the, on the y-axis up here. Now, you'll notice that it goes from like 8.2 to like 8.3, like 8.1. This doesn't seem like a very big difference, um, but it is a log scale. So this change over here that goes from 8.1 to 7.8, that's actually a 30% um, increase in the acidity, which is making the pH go down. More acidic as lower pH. Yes, absolutely. I've always been so curious about this when I heard that the ocean was navigation because that was neutral. Yeah, so the, so the question is, why do we call it acidification if the ocean is not actually acidic or even going to be acidic anytime soon? The analogy that I use for this is, you know, think about temperature. Like yesterday it was 20 degrees. Today it was 30 degrees. So you might say, oh, I'm really glad it was a little bit warmer today than it was yesterday. I wouldn't say it was warm today, <laughs> right? Um, so we use the term of that change to be like, it was warmer. So we're using acidification in the same way, that the ocean has gone from 8, you know, we're heading down to about 7.8. So it's not going to be acidic, but it's getting more acidic. It's a quirk of language. It's, it, it makes more sense to say it that way than becoming less basic. <laughs> yeah. OK, so, um, so you can see that it's gone up and down over time in the last 400,000 years. And if you're, a, if you're a climate nerd, you'll notice that those are the glacial, interglacial cycles in there, um, that, that you can see those ups and downs going on. Um, and then this is the prediction over here, going from 8.1 down to about 7.8. And the way that it looks here, it's like, well, yeah, I mean, it's changing, but it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But if you put that line over there onto the main graph, what you get is an arrow that's pointing straight down. So we have a big change that's happening really fast in terms of the rate at which things have changed in the past. So, ocean acidification is happening really fast. About 25% of the CO2 that we generate from fossil fuel burning um, dissolves in the oceans. So that's resulted in a 30% increase um, since the start of the industrial age in ocean acidity already, and we're gonna keep going with that. It's gonna increase another 100 to 150% by 2100, and it's happening 10 times faster than it has over the last 50 million years. So. Big change happening fast in terms of the record that we know about. So this is the basic picture, right? We have increasing atmosphere to atmospheric CO2 causes the ocean to be more acidic, and then that can cause adverse biological impacts. So we're just gonna look at that part first. There's another part coming. So adverse biological impacts. Let's look at some of these organisms over here. We've got oysters. Anybody know what that is? It's a, it's a pteropod. It's a mollusk. It's a pteropod, um, sometimes called a sea butterfly. They're very small. Um, and this, they flap these little wings, which is why they're called like, butterflies. Um, but they're very sensitive to ocean acidification. They're important prey for a lot of fish species, including salmon. Um, does anybody know the story of, of the oyster hatcheries and what happened like hmm, nine or ten years ago? Yeah, I got a, I got a, a couple of hands, people nodding <laughs> a little bit. So let's, let's go over it real quick. So what happened, this was about 2008, 2009. Um, some of the local hatcheries here in the Salish Sea started noticing that their oyster larvae were dying like crazy. Um, you know, they were getting like 90% mortality. 
and they're trying to figure out what was going on. At first they thought maybe it was a virus, um, but eventually they figured out it was the water that they were bringing in through their pumps was too acidic. And these little tiny oysters, so this is kind of the size they are when they send them out. You can see somebody's fingertip there, right? They're really small. Um, so in those very early stages, they only have a certain amount of energy. And if they need to do all their growing, and if it takes more energy to build that shell because the water is acidic, then basically they run out of juice and, and a bunch of them don't make it. So it's, it's, a, it's a simplification, that's basically the story. So that's their business is to raise and sell oysters fat and 90% of them are dying. So that's a bad thing, right? <laughs> if you're a business person. Uh, so if you were in charge of an oyster hatchery, what do you, anybody have any ideas? What would you do? Or have you heard about some of the things that they did do? Go to Hawaii. Go to Hawaii. Yep. Wait for cold weather. Well, yeah, we'll wait for better conditions, right? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, this is essentially some of the things that they did do. Um, wait for better conditions, which in this, in this case is actually more of a like day versus night or the way that the direction the wind is blowing affects what the pH is out there in the water. So this is like during the daytime and there's a lot of photosynthesis going on, sucking up all the CO2, so this chemistry is better, so spawn. And then at night or on a different tide or a different um, you know, wind, then you've got unfavorable pH, turn off the pumps, don't spawn. So that's one thing that they've been able to do immediately. The other thing is you can basically put baking soda in the water. <laughs> Like if you bring in water in through a pipe, you can put, put stuff in it. It's a limited amount of water. So you can add carbonate or bicarbonate to the water. Or you can move. So they did actually develop or expand um, a hatchery operation in Hawaii that works on a saltwater aquifer. It's not connected to the ocean at all. So um, those were their short-term plans of what they did. Um, their longer-term response was doing monitoring and research so they could dodge that bat water. And then in the medium term, do some selective breeding. You know, animals have a, an amazing capacity to adapt and we can speed that up quite a bit um, through selective breeding. So the oyster companies are doing that. Um, and then long term, promote policies to reduce emissions um, and strengthen research and monitoring. You know, that if we don't change the root of the problem, um, through you know, effective climate policy, it's only gonna keep getting worse. And they recognize that um, as part of their business. So, so that's kind of the, the basic story with oysters, which holds true for a lot of organisms that, that have shells, essentially. Um, they have a bit of a problem when there's high CO2 in the water. So let's look at the other side of that coin about those organisms that might do well when there's a lot of CO2 in the water. So one of our favorite organisms around here is eelgrass. Um, so here's a nice picture of some, some marina. And the research on marina and eelgrass in general um, shows that when there's more CO2, indeed, it grows faster. You have to have kind of a lot of CO2 for it to be noticeable. Um, but it does benefit from having extra CO2 in the water in terms of how fast it grows. So that seems like a plus. So this is, this is Tyler, one of my graduate students, um, with some of his eelgrass. So he did some experiments to try to, to try to really nail down what those effects are like. If you have more CO2 in the water, um, what effect does that have on how fast the eelgrass takes up carbon and how it changes the water around it? So it turns out that the effect of CO2 on the growth of eelgrass is pretty small. A lot of the experiments that have shown that there's a, a big effect, you know, there's more CO2, it grows more, they really crank the CO2 levels up really high <laughs> so that they could measure it, which is it's a reasonable thing to do. But if you put the CO2 level more at what we expect to find around here, the differences in how fast it grows, are, they're pretty small. 
So, but that's not to say that it doesn't matter. Because under certain circumstances, like if there's a lot of eelgrass, and if the water is shallow, then that eelgrass can change the chemistry of that water quite a bit. So if you've got a big eelgrass bed next to your oyster bed, that eelgrass is really going to change the chemistry of the water that flows through it um, under circum certain circumstances. So it can be really important. Eelgrass is important for a number of other reasons, though not just because how it takes carbon out of the water. Um, it provides a lot of important habitat, so eelgrass is important for a number of different reasons. Um, and carbon is just one part of it. So let's look at some other species and what we know about them. So this is a figure um, from a paper that came out a few years ago. And just to kind of orient you to what's going on here, the, each of these circles is a different species. And the colors, the red, so like oysters, clams, and scallops, those are things that have likely negative effects from ocean acidification. The size of the circle is um, how much money is made from that fishery. So these are all farmed species right here. So you can see that oysters, clams, scallops, all those shellfish are expected to do poorly under increasing, increasingly acidified conditions. Um, Atlantic and Pacific salmon, we really don't know. Maybe they'll do more poorly. There's a lot of studies that show that fish, particularly their sense of smell, gets messed up um, under ocean acidification conditions. But most of the species particularly fish species around here, we don't, we don't know what the direct effects are going to be. So let's look at the next um, slide here. So these are wild species, and this is north, um, Northeast Pacific, so these are, many of them are species that are around here, although not all of them. And so now we've got some different colors. We've got phytoplankton down here, which are blue. They're the only one that are blue, which is for likely having a positive effect. So this is that CO2 carbon fertilization, more CO2, they expected to be essentially happy. Photosynthesizers hanging out there. Um, macroalgae, mixed effects. Seagrasses, neutral. There's other things that can happen with acidification, like maybe increases in how susceptible they are to disease and that sort of thing that could balance out the positive effects. So then we've got all of our gooey duck, clams, scallops, abalone, shell pteropods, all these red, red ones here. Those are a lot of them things with shells um, that have a harder time when there's not as much carbonate in the water. Um, crabs are a maybe negative, but you'll notice there's just a lot of gray up here, which means we don't know at all. We don't even really have a guess. So there's a lot of things farther up in the food web in particular, we don't, we don't know what's going to happen. So let's think about a few in particular. Phytoplankton, we already mentioned. We have that positive effect from carbon fertilization. Seagrass, carbon fertilization versus some other things that might be going on, like disease resistance. And then herring are up here in the, in the we don't know category. We know a few things, though, and we'll get to that in a minute. So, do you have a question? What were the squares for? Ah, the squares are things that are not harvested. So they don't have a size because you know, nobody's, you know, eating seals. Well, maybe a few people in Alaska, but they're not harvested for commercial purposes. Okay, so. We've got this idea of CO2 going into the ocean causing adverse biological effects. So I'm going to add in the next complicating factor, which is in the Salish Sea, we're not in the open ocean, right? This is the environment that we live in. We've got water that's surrounded by land. These huge watersheds that are full of all kinds of, they're full of forests and farms and cities and roads. And all of this is feeding into the Salish Sea. So, We've got this basic picture of CO2, and then we're going to add in nutrients. So we've got algal blooms that can be caused by nutrient inputs um, from storm water, essentially, or other types of runoff. Um, 
those algal blooms can then die and sink. And as they decompose, the oxygen in the bottom water gets used up. And then that's another type of adverse biological effect. That is also, in fact, as that carbon breaks down, as those algae break down, they use up the oxygen and they produce more CO2. So it's causing the bottom water to be even more acidic and also not have very much oxygen. So you can have this additive effect from this kind of global problem of atmospheric CO2 and then the local problem of runoff. And they're both combining um, to form this water that's not very hospitable to some organisms. So here's another way of another diagram for thinking about this. So we've got river coming in with all that stuff that I was just talking about. And then even that coming in isn't, isn't all that's going on. We have exchange with the sediments. So you can have various nutrients and carbon going in and out of the sediments. Um, we've got exchange with the atmosphere, of course. So CO2 coming in from the atmosphere. And then we have upwelling. So the deep water that's out in the ocean naturally has a lot of CO2 in it. Um, and over time, that water is also getting more acidic because of ocean acidification. So the water that's coming in from the ocean into the Salish Sea, getting more acidic over time. We don't know what the future of nutrients are necessarily. There are a lot of efforts out there to curb nutrient inputs, but it remains to be seen how effective they will be. Um, and it turns out actually that local um, emissions of CO2 are also important in terms of the amount of CO2 that dissolves into the water. So we've got our future of nutrients and our local emissions both can have an impact on our local water chemistry. All right, so let's get back to our biological impacts for a minute. I put a little red box around the ones that we know are going to have problems. So the sea butterflies, oysters, things with shells in general. We've got a yellow box for the eelgrass there. Some positive, some neg negative, maybe turning out neutral. And then I've got a question mark over here. So we've got some, some more kind of brackets on the food web that we're talking about so far. And I want to talk first about the phytoplankton. So you can see in this picture that, and I probably already know, that phytoplankton are really diverse. Like there are a lot of different um, types of phytoplankton out there. And it's reasonable to think that they're not all going to respond in the same way. So we, at first glance, think, I'll put a green box around there, we think they're probably generally positive. They have more of their raw material, it seems reasonable as a first guess that they're going to do great. So if we think of that, then we can look at a food web like this, where we've got diatoms at the bottom here. So here's our diatoms, which are pretty big, juicy phytoplankton. And they're being eaten by some zooplankton. We've got a little copepod there it's eating the diatoms, which is then eaten by some small fish, could be a herring, um, which is then eaten by a big predatory fish. So if you think of this sort of rising tide idea, you might end up with a situation where if you have more phytoplankton or bigger phytoplankton that are growing faster, maybe you would have zooplankton that are growing and eating faster. And some of the research that we've done in, in my lab has, has shown that to an extent. Um, then you could have more fish and everybody would be happy, except for the oysters. Um, but there are other possibilities. So what if you end up with more of these small phytoplankton, which are over to the side here, your pico and nano-sized phytoplankton? Those tend to be more strongly connected with the microbial loop and with bacteria that are in the water, and more strongly connected with this sort of alternate food web that goes over here to different types of zooplankton, and then up to cnidarians or jellyfish. So there's a possibility that if you change the conditions, the types of phytoplankton that are growing will be different, and then the communities that they support will be different. So, is there evidence that something like that is happening? Well, this is um, a graph from 
uh, Salish Sea Marine Survival Project. This is looking at 20 years of um, zooplankton data. So this is zooplankton as that second level up. And so you can see there's larval barnacles and other mollusks um, that seem to be pretty steady over time. And then in this purple line here, you see comb jellies, um, which seem to be increasing over time. Um, at this particular location, this one is Cherry Point. There's another paper that came out not too long ago that seemed to indicate that also in the South Sound, they were seeing increases in um, gelatinous zooplankton over time as well. So this is not to, I'm not, not saying jellyfish have taken over the world. <laughs> Um, and I'm not saying that it's caused by ocean acidification, but there do seem to be some hints and indications that in the Salish Sea, um, phytoplankton and zooplankton assemblies might be changing. Um, the composition of what we're seeing out there isn't steady over time. And there, there might be more of these um, jellyfish-like organisms now than there used to be. If that were the case, then you would be shifting away from this food web that's supporting these large fish and more towards a food web that's um, a little different from that. And I think it's a really important point to think about in terms of ocean acidification, that even if ocean, even if the sort of most dire thing happens and nobody does anything about climate and carbon emissions and the oceans end up sort of in our worst case scenario in terms of acidification, it's not going to be a dead zone out there. It's not going to be um, everything's, we're not going to kill the oceans. Uh, but we have the capacity to change the oceans quite a bit, and possibly in ways that don't support human society as well as they have in the past. So the ocean's very, very resilient. Um, but human society might be less resilient to the changes that we're forcing on the ocean. OK. So. Let's talk about herring. So we've talked about phytoplankton and zooplankton and how those communities could be changing. Um, and then we've got forage fish in the middle here, of which herring is, of course, a very important example. And I had to, I had to add an orca off to the side here because there wasn't one on this figure. But it's our, our favorite link in the food web having to do with herring. Um, so, so Pacific herring are really important. Forage fish in general are really important as this link in the ocean food web. So around here in the Salish Sea, there are 18 known Pacific herring stocks. And my student Christina did a study on the Cherry Point population, which is in red at the top there. And one of my caveats here is that several of these populations are genetically distinct from each other, and they might not all respond in the same way. So we looked at Cherry Point. Um, which is the one that's been declining the most over time. So one thing that's important about herring and when we think about their effect or how they might be affected by these changes, um, they spawn in near shore coastal waters um, and they generally spawn on vegetation. So they like to spawn on eelgrass and other algae um, that could be in the, in the near shore environment. So what do we know about how they're affected so far? It seems from other experiments that people have done that changes in CO2 or pH don't probably have a really big effect on them. Most of the studies have been done on Atlantic herring, but they're very closely related to Pacific herring. Um, temperature, we know, is a problem for them. If it gets too warm, bad things happen, which we talk about in a minute. And we also want to know, well, what happens if you change PCO2 and temperature? Uh, because that's what's happening out there in the real world, right? So you've got temperature increasing and CO2 increasing at the same time. So we wanted to look at that. So here's Christina out um, getting her, getting some herring <laughs> to, uh, to do this work. Um, so she looked at fertilization success. So how, how many of the eggs end up being fertilized and then how many of them uh, stay alive. This is, a, this is what a live embryo looks like, and this is a dead one. She took videos and looked at the heart rate um, of these, these developing embryos, and then how big they were and how long they were when they hatched. 
And these ones are deformed. This sort of curl that they have means they won't be able to swim. So that's a non-successful hatching there. So hatching success. So she looked at all those things and found that in general, warm temperature was the primary stressor um, affecting these Pacific herring. So when you go um, from 50 to 60 degrees or Fahrenheit, 10 to 16 degrees Celsius, the embryo heart rates go up um, and their mortality goes up and hatching success goes down and larval lengths go down. So a lot of this is probably related to that as temperature goes up, basically their energy demand goes up. So their like, little hearts are pumping and um, they're not able to grow as well because they're using all this energy for sort of respiration. So um, temperature, increased temperature is not good for um, larval herring. And so this is where we combine CO2 and temperature. So over here is the mortality, so how many of them died. And then we've got four different conditions. So this one, first one is um, current CO2 um, and sort of current temperature, 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 10 degrees Celsius. So about 20% of them die under those conditions, their normal mortality rate. If you go to a future temperature, um, then that goes up to a 40% mortality rate. And if you go to future temperature and future CO2, that goes up to about 60% mortality rate. So, you know, so the difference between 20% and 60%, um, you know, that could be very, <laughs> it's a lot, right? It's a lot. This is, this is one study, so, you know, it's, it's not certain, but um, it does suggest that the combination of temperature and CO2 could be really dangerous for, um, for herring larvae. So, you know, I'm going to turn my herring larvae upside down there. <laughs> uh, so this could, this could be bad, right? That, um, that if we have this, um, we have this link here that if it's really damaged by these twin um, stressors of increased temperature and increased CO2, then all of these other higher species in the, in the food web that depend on that link um, could be harmed by that as well. Um, ha, I have another part to the story, though it's complicated. It's always complicated. So we did our study in the lab, um, in, the, in little dishes, little glass dishes. In the real world, um, the eggs, whoa, are um, on eelgrass or other vegetation. So there's a possibility that even though the water around them is more acidic, they're sitting on a surface that's actively removing CO2 from the water. So they may have some protection because of that. Um, the other piece of this story is that that's not the end of their life, right? I mean, it's, it's a tough world out there for herring larvae. Um, and there's a lot of mortality after they hatch and as they're trying to grow. Um, and there have been other studies on Atlantic herring that have actually shown that the effect of higher CO2 on the plankton is beneficial. So you have more food or more nutritious food that's available under high CO2 conditions. And even though they don't hatch as much, they get more energy. The ones that make it do better after they're hatching. And so the overall effect could actually be positive, even for the herring. So it's an interesting object lesson that you can't do a relatively simple experiment and say, well, that's it. <laughs> Check the box. We know they're doomed. Um, but it's really important to think about how all of the different pieces fit together and try to keep expanding the scope of what you look at and trying to get closer and closer to what's actually happening out there in the real world, um, which is hard to do. But we're, we're, we're hard at work. We're trying. We're trying to get there. Um, so we're going to stay with our red box around our carbon, um, calcium carbonate with shell species. And we're going to stay with our question mark here for the plankton and the, uh, and the herring. It's, uh, I think the, the jury is still out on exactly what's going to happen with them. OK. Oh, yeah, I put rainbow boxes around them to indicate that. Maybe it's positive. Maybe it's negative. Maybe it's somewhere in between. It depends. Okay, 
So we put it all together, plus we add in the fact that there's adaptation that can be happening. You know, when we do an experiment in the lab over the course of a few weeks, um, it's maybe not the best representation of what happens out there in the real world. This acidification is happening really fast relative to what's happened before, but it's still happening over many generations for some of these organisms. So there is a, there is a potential capacity for some adaptation. So basically you put it all together and the magic eight ball says, uh, reply hazy, <laughs> try again later. Um, so we're, we're working towards understanding these systems, but, um, but it's pretty complex. And so there are a lot of pieces that have to be continually adding in until we can get a realistic picture of what's gonna happen. So some of the main points um, I'd like you to remember, the ocean is, oceans are becoming more acidic because of inputs of carbon dioxide. Um, the Salish Sea acidity is also driven by runoff and nutrient inputs, as well as upwelling. There's a lot of variability in these conditions in the Salish Sea over time and space. We didn't talk about that a whole lot, um, but because of the vegetation and because of the winds and the upwelling and all of these other things, conditions can be very different from one place to another or from one time of day or time of year to another. Effects are widespread but not easily predictable. And that local action can influence our local waters. So I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about that, about what those actions can be. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so be engaged in political action and support responsible climate policies. I mean, you guys were just talking about, um, about some of this right before, right before my talk started. So I know you're, I know you're on board with this. Um, and support, lo support local water quality efforts as well. Um, it's really important. And then reduce your nitrogen and nutrient footprint as well, because that also ties directly into this in our local waters. So, you know, this could be septic maintenance, it could be rain gardens and other low impact development, it could be using fertilizer appropriately. Um, there's all kinds of ways you could be responsible about nutrients. And then, of course, reduce your carbon footprint. So I want to do a little exercise here for, for a minute. And you don't necessarily all have pieces of paper or anything in front of you, but I'm going to give you a minute and I want you to think about or write down if you have a piece of paper. What do you think some of the three, what are the top three ways you personally and your personal actions can reduce your carbon footprint? Take a minute, think about it. One of the rookie mistakes of unexperienced teachers is not give enough pe people enough time. Be uncomfortable with silence. Okay, let's let's hear some of your ideas. What what can everybody do? Yeah. Well, in our case, uh, we have salt. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, it reduces our dependence on electricity. Absolutely. So install solar, rooftop solar, on your house or your garage. Yeah. I think the number one thing is energy efficiency. Energy efficiency. Yeah. Doing a home energy audit and acting on the recommendations. Yeah. So do a home energy audit. Do what you can to you know make sure your home is operating efficiently. Yes? Air travel is a big one. Yeah. Fly less or not at all. Fly less or not at all. Drive less. Drive less. Absolutely. Yeah. Stop eating meat or lower your consumption. Absolutely. More plant based diet. You guys are pretty good. You're getting, you're getting some of the big ones. So, Here's a, a paper that came out uh, in 2017, and the biggest one, nobody ever, nobody ever says this one, have one fewer child. 
And the first time I saw this, or as this came up in conversation with, with somebody, you'd be like, that this is what, you know, somebody told me that they were going to not have children because of the carbon impact. And I was really taken aback by that because it felt like that is a really, really big decision to be basing on your carbon footprint. But the more, I mean, you know, the more I grow into this, and, you know, this is, this is my son, he's eight. Um, and, and so, you know, thinking about him and be like, well, yeah, you know, this is the future. This is really important. This is the kind of thing that you should be making decisions of that magnitude because of this, because it's critical, it's vital. Um, yes? Sure, yeah, so using, yeah, cutting down on the amount of plastic that we use. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so a lot of people don't think of childbearing decisions, but that's, it's, it's the biggest thing that, that a person can actually do. Um, live car free, so we, we talked about that. Um, there's a, several different car ones in here, so car free is the biggest one. Um, let me just talk about the scale here. This is savings um, in tons per year. So. Uh, it's 60 tons a year um, by adding one less um, American to the world. Uh, <laughs> live car free is like two and a half. So there's a, a big difference there. And then we talked about flights. So transatlantic flight is a pretty big one. That's one and a half tons. Um, green energy, so that fits in with the solar panels. Um, but that's sort of general idea. Uh, it's another one and a half tons. Some of the ones that that people commonly think of are kind of way down in the basement here that, you know, people who are like, oh, I'm going to be green, I'm going to recycle. <laughs> like, re recycling, you know, is, it's good. Or I'm going to upgrade my light bulbs, I'm going to use all, like, you know, CFLs and LEDs. Like, that, that's good too. I mean, every little bit helps. But, you know, the person who's like, I have bought all my energy efficient light bulbs and now I'm off to Hawaii. <laughs> it, it's, I mean, it's for real. This is a thing that, 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 that you do something small and then get this sense of virtue and then you feel like you've paid your dues and it's okay for you to do something that's not virtuous. Um, and the, the magnitude of those two different things is very different. Um, I think it's important for people to understand that. So, um, so you guys can hit all these big ones. I added, the, I added this one over here myself. I'm not sure why it wasn't considered in this paper about insulating and sealing your house. Um, but it's, it's, it's right up there in terms of it can be a really big impact. So, um, so these are the things that we should be doing. Eating plant-based diets, not flying, being really efficient, thinking about our transportation. Yes? That's for one person. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, so these are the things we should be doing. Um, this is one of my favorite cartoons. And it, the type might be a little small, so I'll read it. It says, day 44, still stranded with nothing but flat, empty water as far as the eye can see. So we've got a, a little person on a desert island there with all of this amazing stuff going on under the water, but they can't see it. Um, and I, I think it's just really evocative of the reality of how we relate to the ocean. There is a lot going on beneath the surface, but you know, we're land animals and it's, it's difficult for us to see under the surface. We're, we're just getting started with it. Um, we have a lot to learn. And I think that caution about changing the world really drastically would probably be a good place to start from because we don't know what the effects are going to be. So, we have some time for questions. Yes? Uh, this is an interesting uh, presentation uh, on, on, uh, on the subject. Uh, do you interface with CDOCs who are also... Do you interact interact with sea docs who are also doing research on ocean acidification? So I haven't worked personally, personally with anybody at sea doc, um, but I'm familiar with, with the work that they do, and I think they're a really great organization um, and are doing a lot of good stuff. There's, there are definitely efforts to sort of coordinate 
um, among people who are doing this kind of work. There's a Washington Ocean Acidification Center um, that does some of that type of work, and um, we try to keep up with each other and what each other are doing. Yeah. I've always wondered about Shannon Point. Um, do you folks, how many folks are there working the science issues and do you have open houses? We do have open houses at Shannon Point. So how many people are there? Um, there are, I want to say five or six um, kind of scientists who are, who are based there. And then there are people like me who are based on the main campus but also work at Shannon Point. Um, there are probably, I think, around 15 or 20 kind of marine science people at Western in general um, in the, among the different areas. And yes, there are open houses at least once a year, um, but I'm not sure when the next one is, probably in the springtime, but we haven't got a date for it yet that I know of. Yes? Uh, another question, uh, there was a presentation by uh, beach watchers uh, a couple of weeks ago, and the presenter was talking about cameras, and uh, and the herring up at uh, Cherry Point were in major decline. Mm -hmm. uh, but they said in some places, um, other places are declining too. But overall, are herring increasing? You mean like in the Salish Sea? In the Salish Sea. I don't think so. Um, I think there have been, like I said, there are 18 different stocks. Um, and there are about three kind of genetically distinct um, groupings within that. And they all spawn at different times. Um, so Cherry Point is the stock that's gone down the most over time. Um, a lot of them are sort of up and down, but more or less steady. I think there's one or two that have had slight increases, but overall, um, I think it's a slight decrease over time. I mean, on a very long time scale, they're, they're down quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Could you say a few words about the, the impact on the world of that? Absolutely. So coral reefs um, are one of the habitats that are expected to be um, to have pretty pretty drastic impacts from ocean acidification. So studies on the Great Barrier Reef have shown that the rate at which it's growing is already declining. It's declined by about 25 percent. So they're not building as much coral as it has in the past. Um, there have been a lot of, there have been five or six times in the Earth's history when the oceans have become pretty acidic um, from natural variability. And during those times, coral reefs have pretty much been wiped out. Um, there are generally like a few different spots around the world where there's these areas of refuge and they survive and then they kind of recolonize out from there. And this is something that happens on the scale of millions of years. So people are, are looking at this now in terms of coral reefs. And sometimes I say that if you wanna, if you wanna see the Great Barrier, Great Barrier Reef, you better go now, but don't go. <laughs> because it's a lot of carbon to get there on an airplane. <laughs> um, yeah, it's looking pretty grim for, the, for coral reefs. Um, there are areas that they've found that have naturally high levels of CO2, and the coral that grows there seems to be resilient. Um, and so they're thinking about different things that they could do, like, well, what if we take the genes from these ones and genetically modify the coral in other places to make them resistant, which is something to make a, a green warrior kind of shudder. <laughs> oh, save coral reefs, genetic modification, I don't know. <laughs> um, or selective breeding, these kinds of things. Um, but, um, but yeah, coral, coral are, um, it's not looking so good for the coral reefs. Yes? Can you say a little bit about 
bit about jellyfish. Do they have any predators, or can we find any good uses for them? It's a <laughs> question about jellyfish, if they have predators, and if there are other uses for them. They do certainly have predators, and the, um, the smaller ones in particular are, are eaten by fish and other organisms. Um, and sea turtles like to eat jellyfish. Um, there's been various different ideas of what could be done with jellyfish. In some other cultures, people eat jellyfish. It might be a hard sell to get Americans to start eating them. Um, I saw one product that was actually a, a diaper that was made out of jellyfish. <laughs> like, you think about it, right? Like if you like dry that stuff out, like, you'd be really super absorbent. <laughs> Again, I'm not sure if parents are going to be like, really want to have jellyfish diapers. I thought it was a fun idea, though. Um, <laughs> so um, there, there are ideas out there about, about jellyfish. I think the other thing to keep important, that's important to keep in mind about jellyfish is that um, they're naturally very kind of boom and bust in their populations. Um, and so there's been a lot of reporting in the news about jellyfish are taking over the ocean. Um, but there's no actual firm scientific evidence for anything of this sort. Um, the sort. The ships that we're seeing here in the Salish Sea are fairly subtle. Um, and things that you see that happen in other places, there are these jellyfish blooms, and then people are like, oh, God, jellyfish are taking over. Um, so I would, I would take anything that you see about, about overabundance of jellyfish with a grain of salt. <laughs> I appreciate there must be a lot of variability in the local pH in the, in the local waters uh, on all sorts of different time scales, daily, seasonal, interannual. Is there any um, significant trend, long-term trend in the pH in the local waters? And how about offshore? So, yeah, so the question is about if they're overlaid on all this variability if we know if there's a trend in the pH in local waters and in the offshore waters. Um, so offshore for sure, because it's much less variable, so it's a lot easier to get that record. Um, and you can see it very definitely going down, pH going down over time. Um, in terms of records here in the Salish Sea, I don't think there's one that really definitively shows it, although there have been, there have been some studies. So Dick Feely, who's down at University of Washington, is kind of the guy for this sort of thing and has, has some papers that show, using some other types of evidence, um, that it's, the waters have become more acidic um, you know, over the last 100 years, 50 years or so. Um, but it's not, the, it's not easy to pick out from a record from a pH meter. Because if you look at the pH meters out here at, at Padilla Bay, you know, they're all over the place. It goes, from a, it goes up to pH 9 sometimes, and sometimes it goes down to pH 7. Um, it's really, really variable. Um, but we, we know from what's happening in the ocean, in the open ocean, and what's happening in the atmosphere, that we can expect it to becoming more acidic over time. And so we think that what's going to happen is you have these swings and this, you know, really acidic water that's happening at that peak, maybe at the bottom peak if you're thinking about pH, it's dipping lower. And as the baseline goes down over time, that low is going to keep getting lower and probably be dipping into territory that's um, critical for some organisms. Um, but it is overlaid on top of a lot of variability, which makes it harder to predict. Well, why don't we take uh, one more question, if there is one more. And um, this has just been excellent. Oh, thank you. D did you have a question, Eric? Gonna wait for the microphone. Yeah. So it seems like there's two competing, or I perceive it to be two competing adverse factors, which is temperature and CO2 or acidity. So are they both 
synergistically adverse or is one worse than the other? Um, I think it really depends on what organism you're talking about. Okay. So for herring, for instance, the temperature is a stronger effect and then you add CO2 on top of that and it has this additive or even synergistic negative effect. But for other organisms, they could actually be working in opposite directions um, where temperature is beneficial and CO2 is um, detrimental or, or vice versa. It, it really depends on, on which organism you're talking about. Well, I was thinking about your oyster one. The oh, for the oyster oysters. spats, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think in general, the increase in temperature is probably not going to be um, harmful for a local oyster larvae. I think that probably they're still in the range that's going to be just fine for them. Uh, if they come from Hawaii. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Um, when you think about our, so those were Pacific oysters, which are not a native species also. If you think about our native oysters, um, the Olympia oysters, they, um, they're probably fairly comfortable in that, in the expected temperature ranges. So it's more of a pH thing that would be a problem for them. Okay, well, gosh, thank you so much. This was outstanding. Oh, you're very welcome. <laughs>